What happened to Canada's health care at COP26? COP26 in Glasgow was the last conference of the parties of the UN climate group. And there's going to be another one coming up in just about a week in Egypt. So we're going to look at net zero health care. No patients, no emissions. Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. And normally we deal directly with climate science, but we found that the healthcare system has been co-opted by the climate movement. And we think that there are some serious implications for Canadians. And there are things that are flying under the radar. Although there are many publicized reports that fossil fuel addiction is killing us, and this is said by doctors, I'm going to show you how ridiculous those kinds of statements are and what kinds of problems these concepts and, and this kind of policy making is going to lead us into. So follow with me, see what you think, and uh, there's probably lots more research to be found on this, but um, this is what I have come across recently and I wanted to mention you know it's odd that we have to do this kind of research you would think that the mainstream media would be doing this kind of research but here we are a small little nonprofit researching things that you really need to know about so as I go through this if there are things that strike you as being important I hope that you'll decide to support us so let's go on with the show and see what I found So, at the COP26 conference, Canada signed on to the World Health Organization's COP26 health program, thus formally committing to climate resilient and low carbon sustainable health systems. Now what? Yes, indeed, now what? What does that entail? Has anyone in the mainstream media told us anything about it? Well, it's quite unbelievable because the World Health Organization backs the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, as reported here in the National Observer, and the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment uh, is now wanting to ban fossil fuel advertising because they think it's fueling a public health crisis. And they've written to all these ministers and they claim to represent more than 700,000 health professionals across Canada. Well, that's very surprising because you'd wonder how health professionals wouldn't know that this mask is made from fossil fuels. These gloves are made from fossil fuels. It's very likely that the uh, inhaler, container, and even the uh, compression of the gases within it and the medication within it are also made from fossil fuels. But here we have tax-funded, tax-paid doctors trying to ban fossil fuel advertising, and they're saying <clears throat> how fossil fuel ads make us sick this is the same imagery, the same kind of imagery that they use for coal phase out in Ontario and coal phase out in Alberta. And you have to ask yourself, why are tax paid doctors advocating against fossil fuels? There is no modern medicine without oil, natural gas and coal. Health, longevity and quality abundant food and medicine is only possible with fossil fuel energy the product stream and fertilizer for food. And we address this in our 2015 report called Burning Questions. Modern healthcare needs reliable, affordable energy. Otherwise, we're going to be back on the kitchen table like this. And electricity was recognized by the UK Department of Health as the most vital of all infrastructure services because without it, most other services will not function. Now you'd think that doctors would know that. Let's look at electricity production by source in the world. Well, most of it's produced by oil, gas, and coal. And if you want to talk about hydro or nuclear, you can't have either of those without oil, gas, and coal to uh, make the facilities, right? So. Um, 
it's interesting also to see that energy is life. If you look at the uptick in oil, gas, and coal, it closely matches the longevity of people in the world. The only people lagging behind are those in Africa, and that's because the West is banning Africans with their climate colonialist policies, preventing them from having grid-scale power, um, pumped water and sanitation, and lighting 24-7, and industry. So we're trying to force renewables on them, which is not very nice of us. But medical anti-oil madness will be peaking soon because COP27 is coming up in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt from November the 6th to the 18th. And here are some of the doctors who will be attending. Dr. Courtney Howard and Dr. Joe Vipond are from Calgary. Dr. Vipond is the president of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. And they will be jumping on the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Bandwagon, which is a project started by Tsapora Berman, who is formerly of Forest Ethics and Stand Earth, and uh, of course one of the lead figures in the Tar Sands Campaign against Alberta. So what are these doctors thinking? <laughs> Everything they use every day in medicine to keep them safe is made from oil, gas, and coal. From the product stream, from the energy, from the uh, materials used to make the uh, uh, metal uh, containers for the big equipment like um, CAT scanners and such like. You can't make those solid, very big pieces of equipment for radiology, for x-rays, for CAT scanners, MRIs. You need coal to make that steel. You need energy and you need uh, lots of power to run those things. So look at the use of oil and gas in the medical field. Safety equipment, rubber gloves, soap, masks, hand sanitizer, medical equipment, syringe, stethoscope, band-aids, IVs, plastic protection wraps. Yes, all those sterile band-aids, all those sterile equipment and tools, um, all the single-use plastics for uh, special operation procedures, research equipment like microscope, test tubes, safety goggles, lab burner, how about advanced equipment like artificial limbs, heart valves, respirators, MRI scanners, database equipment, how about making the hospital, how about the backup generator, the ambulance, the helicopter, what, Stars Air Ambulance is going to run on solar panels? Please give me a break. So you've seen some of these articles in the, in the news, no doubt. This was on CTV, both of these. Doctors say fossil fuel addiction kills and starves millions. <laughs> That's the exact opposite. There can't be anything more opposite than that. We actually have an energy crisis in the world. The uh, UN uh, uh, predicts that 345 million people will be facing starvation because of the energy crisis, because we can't ship wheat to them, we can't get enough fuel to them, and wheat prices are skyrocketing, again, because of the energy crisis. And that's because of climate activism and people like Mark Carney, who've driven off investors over the past couple of decades. So this is going to be probably at least a decade-long disaster, if not longer. Um, and it's certainly not fossil fuels that caused any of this. It's climate activism. And let's look at this one here. This doctor, in this report, claimed that you know it's climate change because uh, medical instruments were covered in ash from wildfires. Well, that's interesting because we address that in burning questions. Wildfires have always been around. It's not a sign of climate change. And as a matter of fact, ironically, in 2011, wildfires put out almost a thousand times the PM 2.5 of Alberta coal-fired power plants. So, uh, you know, we shut down coal and lost our affordable energy advantage in Alberta and it cost us about $22 billion. And uh, we ended up with lots of people out of work. 
And here we have tax-funded unions and charities are funding CAPE to put people out, people out of work. So here is Dr. Vipond on the coal phase-out campaign back in around 2015. And as you can see, this is from 2016 from the CAPE doctors. They're funded by the Asthma um, Association, which is um, a charity in Canada. Alberta Ecotrust funds them. Canadian Union of Postal Workers is funding them. The Union of Public Employees, CUPE, is funding them. Um, Pembina Institute funded them. Tides Canada funded them, also part of the uh, Tar Sands campaign. Unifor. So why are tax-funded unions and charities funding CAPE to put people out of work and destroy modern medicine? There's no modern medicine without oil, gas, and coal. And in fact, the NDP coal phase-out cost Albertans $22 billion and it tripled the pool price, the electricity pool price. In 2015, it was $33 per kilowatt hour and the last 12 months, it's been $106. Uh, dollars per kilowatt hour to June 29th, 20th or so, 2020. So um, Rachel Notley has been claiming that the renewable energy program uh, brought so much money and activity to the province, but in fact we lost so much here, plus we lost 7,000 coal jobs, 30 communities were destroyed, and Alberta's affordable power advantage was lost, and power prices for medical facil facilities are up, right? What does that bring? It brings heat or eat poverty, which kills people. Fossil fuels give life. So this is another one of our reports that talk about heat or eat poverty and the devastating effects it has on people's health and psychology. So this is a pitch for us. If this is interesting to you and you haven't heard about this in the mainstream media, why don't you donate to us or become a member? Join us. Help us with this fight for proper information for the public. Now what's happened is that doctors have adopted this idea of net zero health care and they actually are asking other clinicians to get involved. And here they think that the task of transforming healthcare culture and practice to have, that means to cut emissions in half in healthcare by 2030, uh, seems entirely feasible. <clears throat> and they think it would be feasible because the pivot on COVID was so uh, immediate and to them so successful. Well, here's their utopian dream, which is expensive, unreliable, ideological utopian dreams for planet saving, a waste of public funds intended for people. So here they'd like to put solar panels on a hospital and have battery packs on the side. <laughs> I'll show you about that in just a minute. They'd like low carbon prescribing. They want to have warning systems for heat and air quality. Well, uh, just to let you know, <clears throat> Canada already has Environment Canada, uh, which gives air quality warning and heat warnings every day. The Weather Network follows and, and tracks whatever Environment Canada puts out. Uh, we have that kind of system and you can sign up for those alerts. And we only have about maybe 10 days a year that would be considered extremely hot. The real thing is that most people die of cold. Uh, the number of deaths from cold is many, many, many times higher than the deaths from heat. Even in warm countries, the deaths from cold is many times higher than from heat. So um, it's uh, really amazing that they've gone off the deep end here and they think that everyone should have electric vehicles and um, they are encouraging active transport. So uh, they think encouraging patients and staff to use it. So in one uh, document, they actually are encouraging people to ride their bike to and from work at the hospital to save the planet. <laughs> but let's go on with the uh, idea of putting um, batteries on uh, the hospital, <clears throat> on the side of the hospital. 
So uh, this is an article that we have on our blog and it, we're talking about a dozen homes and what kind of power they would need for batteries. So this is a picture of the uh, Transalta 16 million dollar 20 megawatt hour battery energy storage facility that has been built near Pincher Creek. Uh, it's now operational. The, so it's the size of a soccer pitch. A soccer pitch and the cost of the battery backup for each home's solar energy system would be 1.3 million dollars and that would have to be repeated every 10 years which is the expected battery life. <clears throat> So here we are talking about a dozen of homes, and this is each home would need um, a, a battery backup system that would be 1.3 million if we were using this kind of example. So imagine for a hospital, according to AltaLink, essential services critical to Albertans such as hospitals rely on large amounts of power. On average, hospitals use 1,875,000 kilowatt hours of electricity a month. That's enough to power more than 3,000 typical homes for a month. So imagine how many of these massive batteries and how many trillions of dollars that would end up costing us. And the Canadian uh, health system is not the only one that's all in on this kind of net zero health service. <clears throat> this is a creepy looking cover, don't you think? And look, they're wearing petroleum masks <laughs> and other PPEs. It's just, it's comical, actually. <laughs> but this is not so funny. If you can believe it, this is a peer-reviewed paper. It's time to begin our journey to net zero geriatric medicine. And these authors have estimated the carbon footprint of elderly people. They call them frail people. So the national health system in the UK contributes 5.7% of the carbon footprint of the UK. So they estimate that the carbon footprint of frailty of elderly people to be 1.7 me uh, megatons CO2 equivalent or 7% of the total NHS carbon footprint. So this is entitled Geriatric Medicine in the Era of Climate Change. Look at this. When has the climate not changed? And yet now they're counting your carbon footprint, your energy use, when you're elderly and frail after you've built the country. And here's a real problem. Unexpected longevity is a financial risk for governments and defined pension and defined benefit pension providers. This is from the IMF. So what's happened is that um, the plans for pension funds were made about a century ago and uh, they didn't think that people would live into their 90s in good health. They didn't think that people who were 40, 50 years old who might get sick, let's say some kind of curable cancer, you know, would need these ongoing types of care that became possible. They didn't understand a hundred years ago how fast modern medicine would progress. And in this IMF article, they indicate that even three extra years of life for a person, that's good for the person, but it's bad for the pension plan. It becomes a greater liability. So what they really were saying is that providing the public with good health care in a timely way will destroy your pension plan and create huge unfunded liabilities for you. Um, and instead of trying to address this in any public, transparent, constructive way, um, it seems like people are being denied health care, right? And it's all seemingly going under now this cover of climate change. And uh, let's go on and see. It's, it's, um, it's probably quite true, but shocking that it hasn't been brought to the attention of the public. And sure enough, here we have mobilizing public health action on climate change. This is a recent uh, release from Dr. Tam's department. Um, again, tying together climate change and 
human health. Probably see more animals in here than you see people. That's not really a good sign. And this one is from the O'Brien um, Institute at the uh, University of Calgary. This is a document issued in April 2022. It was sent to all kinds of departments in Alberta. And again, they cited things like uh, um, that we should uh, ride our bikes to work <laughs> and uh, some of the other things from the net zero plan that I just mentioned. Uh, but it's, it's frightening because it's completely out of control. And if you're waiting for hip, knee or heart surgery, no doubt you'll be thrilled that the Canadian Medical Association is very busy with climate change. So why have healthcare and climate change suddenly been conflated? Well, no one really cares about climate change. Everyone cares about health. So this is from an abacus survey back in 2018, and the top public priority was improving healthcare. Climate change was at the bottom, but governments jumped on the climate change bandwagon instead and didn't respond to public needs. So someone clever in marketing thought, well, why don't we just piggyback this onto that, and then people will care about it. And that's what's happening. And we had lots of questions about this switch. Um, we did this video, Alberta Cold Fa Coal Phase Out, What Air Quality Issues? Because Alberta has some of the best air quality in the world. And uh, we also did another one on climate change and health, questioning the Lancet report, because <clears throat> excuse me, the Lancet had come out with a report that was um, um, claiming that doctors uh, were being proactive for climate change, and they felt there should be lots more renewables installed. Well, you can't do surgery with wind and solar power when it's afternoon, especially here in winter, the sun goes down around 4.30. What happens if you're still in surgery? You can't do um, surgery with wind power. It uh, drops off rapidly all throughout the day. You can see that wind power is coming and going. It's never stable. So um, that's going to mess up all of that equipment in the hospital that's so carefully calibrated to make sure that people are properly evaluated. All the things like uh, CAT scanners, PET scanners, MRIs, these are very precision equipment. They need high quality power. It doesn't have any dips or surges. So um, we thought that was ridiculous what the Lancet was proposing. And we couldn't really figure it out anyway. So we called them out on it back in 2018. And it is truly futile folly to imagine that cutting healthcare emissions in Canada would do anything to stop climate change in the world. Because, for instance, China emits in one month about what Canada emits in one and a half years. So even if all of Canada's emissions were wiped off the map, there would be no difference. And let's look at world fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions. So they claim that global emissions in healthcare are about 5%. So that would be around here, a little bit over Russia, which is around 4% of global emissions. So um, you can see that it's nothing. Compared to China, um, it's nothing. Like this would make no difference whatsoever. And yet lots of people would die. But again, the crux of the matter appears to be that OECD countries are facing a $78 trillion in pension liabilities. And the Fraser Institute did a Canadian version of this. It's slightly different, but that um, the combined net direct debt of the federal, provincial, and local governments totaled $1.2 trillion. And that was in 2011-2012. Uh, we're farther in debt than that now. And direct debt alone translates into a $71,000-901 bill for every Canadian. So this goes on to talk about the incredible uh, 
uh, incredibly huge pension liabilities that we have in Canada. And here's a section. You see, in 1956, this is what I was trying to explain before, only 7.7% .7 of Canadians were over 65 years old. That proportion doubled to 15.3 by 2013 and expected to increase to 25.4% by 2061. Simply put, the aging of Canada's population has resulted in large and growing unfunded liabilities. So the funding shortfall is estimated at $792.3 billion for CPP, $494.4 billion for OAS, and $894.7 billion for Medicare. Together, the unfunded liabilities in Canada's pen public pensions and health care programs total $2.2 trillion, or $134,841, for each income tax payer. Now, that's from a couple of years ago, so it's going to be far more ghastly now. And, you know, as we saw, those doctors want to phase out fossil fuels, and yet, where do they think the money comes to pay them, or to pay for health care, or to run their hospitals? So, this is something that uh, Robert Lyman did, a summary of Natural Resources Canada's fact book, so while the energy sector GDP in Alberta in 2020 was the highest in Canada at 59.6 billion, it was significant in all provinces, including notably Ontario, 15.6 billion, Quebec, 12 billion, British Columbia, 11.8 billion, and Saskatchewan, 10.5 billion. And of course, lots of people like to claim the energy industry does not contribute much to government revenues. In fact, the energy industry sector's share of total taxes paid by all industries was 6.9%. So it's billions of dollars that we're talking about that pay these people salaries, and yet they are denigrating the energy industry. So again, I'm going to make yet another pitch Maybe I've convinced you by now. You should be supporting us instead of your local newspaper because we're reporting on the things you need to know and they're not telling you any of this. So please donate now or become a member now. You can go to friendsofscience.org and uh, see what we're up to. So back to Alberta. Um, the Alberta government expense by functions. So. So healthcare is about 40% of Alberta's budget. And you can see here with respect to aging and death, you can see that when people get to be into their 40s and 60s, they start getting some of these more chronic conditions. And uh, many of these are survivable for many more years with good health care, right? So the red is cancer, the green is heart, the yellow is stroke, uh, purple COPD, the kind of uh, violet is injury and other is the blue. Um, so these become very expensive because you're giving a lot of care and treatment to an individual who in many cases is no longer a contributing taxpayer. That's the other thing. Healthcare is Alberta's largest expense uh, this is a more recent statement. It was 43% of the total operating costs of budget 2019, which was $20.6 billion per year. So this is $1 million in packs of 100 of $10,000 packs. And if you extrapolate that, that's what a billion dollars looks like. So it would be 20 of these for health care, just for Alberta. So there really is a health care crisis, and you should read this book. And health care is not like EI. It seems that, you know, some people seem to have the impression uh, that, you know, if they've worked all their lives, they've paid their taxes, uh, some of those taxes are going into health care, and people seem to think that, you know, maybe there's a, like a little pod of, money with their name on it. Like you often hear people saying, when I have my knee surgery, you know, when I had my heart surgery. Um, and there's a sense that, you know, they, they should be entitled to these services when I will have my, my other knee done. 
Um, and because that is the promise of the Canadian government to the people, but it's a promise that cannot be met. And you have to read uh, Susan Martinuk's book and understand that from the beginning, universal health care was not viable. It was never viable. And certainly now, after COVID, it's really in a mess and not viable at all. And uh, the next image beside it is a Moses and I are cartoon, except it's not very funny. It's from his Zoomer magazine, and he's talking about the shortage of uh, long-term care beds in Canada and the shortage of people to go with it, and the numbers are staggering. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. So either, <clears throat> excuse me, either try to track down his magazine, or you can see one of our videos on our website. It's one of these two videos where I discuss it. So anyway, some will try to capitalize on the fact that healthcare is collapsing. And it's um, probably a good time to ask, are the health union pension funds invested in this, in AI and robotics? Um, or are they invested in wind and solar? Are they invested in carbon trading? It's interesting to know why so many are on the bandwagon for this. And we have to think that uh, because people are not being treated, they're being given MAID as an option. So there were a lot of deaths during lockdown, and there will be many, many more rolling out from lockdown. You don't have to be an actuary to look at this and figure out that many thousands of people will suffer from not having timely treatment due to lockdowns um, and probably many will choose made medical assistance in dying and this is a very sad story this 90 year old woman who was actually very well healthy according to her family reports she uh, lived in a retirement home she went through lockdown the first time in her room. She exercised in her room. She was looking forward to being socialized again, get out, out there and enjoying people and walking. And when the second lockdown came around, she said, no, I don't want to live through this again. And she opted for medical assistance in dying, even though she was perfectly healthy otherwise. So, um, you know, what kind of a society are we actually creating here? Yes, made for you. It's cheaper for the government. It's cheaper for the government to give you medical assistance in dying than to give you health care. But actually, there's no need for net zero. So it's wrong to conflate health care and net zero or health care and climate change because it was corrupted science, but now there's been cor corrected science. So these two billionaires, according to Roger PLK Jr., corrupted climate science by um, promoting this scenario, the RCP 8.5, as if business as usual. And they wrote it up in a report called Risky Business, which proliferated through the finance community and then proliferated through the science community as well. Uh, and. Uh, Roger Pielke Jr. has recently reviewed all of the IPCC reports and says that the extreme scenario that the IPCC saw as most likely in 2013 is now judged a low likelihood. So RCP 8.5 is off the charts, RCP 8.6 is off the charts, and so if we look at things, we're actually more on this track. So there's no climate emergency, there's no need for net zero, there's no need to conflate health care and climate change. Now, how do we fix this? Well, part of it, we need money. We need lots of money to fix health care. Uh, that's one thing. And we have 21 trillion US dollars value, gross value in resources, and most of it's here in Alberta. So uh, it turns out that 21 trillion gross value would net out to be about 13 trillion Canadian. And if you could somehow spend $1 million a day, it would take over 35,600 years to spend $13 trillion. And with $13 trillion, you could pay off Canada's entire national debt 13 times. 
or you could have at the time that this was written, which was uh, in 2021. With 13 trillion, you could give $1,733 to every person on the planet. And with 13 trillion, you could give every Canadian $342,000. But much of our prosperity has gone walking out the door. This is another report by Robert Lyman. It's on our blog, and you can find out how hundreds of millions of dollars have walked away due to ridiculous climate policies. But since there's no climate emergency, we don't need those policies anymore. Unfortunately, the federal government climate policies are inflicting cruel and unusual punishment on Canadians, and we've got this live stream recorded and on our website. I ask you to have a look at it because it explains a lot of things. What we really need to do to save Canada, we need to quit Paris, quit the Paris Agreement, pull out, and we need to build pipelines. And again, I'm going to make a donation request. It's our 20th year, so if you could help us out, even with a $20 donation, that would be really helpful. Or if you'd like to become a member, it's $40 for the first year or $80 for three years. And again, this is our homepage on our website. We have a climate essay there that explains our point of view. We have a youth-oriented bilingual climate change 101 website. And you can become a member. You can donate on our website. Or you can just send an e-transfer to uh, Friends of Science, contact at friendsofscience.org. So, um, That's uh, my presentation, and I'd like to thank you all for watching. I think these are very important, very serious things that need to be addressed. I personally, as an Albertan, as a taxpayer, can't stand the thought of tax-funded doctors and tax-funded charities um, destroying the energy industry that makes uh, medicine, modern medicine, possible and that provides the revenues for everything that we need in society, uh, education, infrastructure, the military, international relations, foreign aid, and, uh, and help for our vets. So I think that people really need to take a look, a deeper look at this. And there are other people better placed than our little group to do so. But hopefully we've lit a uh, fire here and somebody will pick up and uh, run with the story and do some more research on it. Um, I think that COP27 is going to be um, something that we should all keep an eye on because we keep thinking these climate policies are being made far away and they don't really affect us. But we're heading into heat or heat of poverty here. And if these climate policies are enforced upon our farmers and ranchers, we're going to be also going hungry ourselves. Uh, that's how serious it is. So please um, have a look at our website. Consider joining us. Consider supporting us. I thank you very much for tuning in. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling.